Alan, again, it is just such a joy to have you with us this morning. Um, just really appreciate, um, really appreciate your time with us. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's good to be with you all, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to sort of indulge in a little bit of storytelling and, and information sharing about Haiti um, and my experience living there. Um, and my, my work in sort of the advocacy space with the Office of Government Relations um, on, on US policy that, that relates to Haiti. Um, so I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, if at any time you all have questions, you know, I, I love an informal style, which is generally easier in person, but um, speak up or I, I assume everyone has access to the chat, um, submit a question there and, and it can sort of guide the conversation as we go. Um, I know not everyone is on video, but sort of a, a rough show of hands or, or anyone speak out. Has anyone actually been to Haiti? 
Uh, yeah, a couple of hands go up. Cool, cool. Where, uh, for those of you who have, where, where did you go? Do you remember or do you know? Port of France. Port of France, okay. And also to that private island that they have somewhere near Haiti. I don't remember the name of it. The, um, through the, um, the cruise ship, the cruise yeah. ship, mm -hmm. Lab yeah. uh, Labadee, I think. It's Labadee, right. right, Labadee. Yeah, Royal Caribbean. Oh, my dad is from Haiti, awesome. Miragon, I've actually never been to Miragon. Um, I'd love to go, uh, I've been to Leogon though. Um, Jacques Mel is beautiful. Um, very, very cool. Okay, so there's some some folks familiar with it, um, you know, in person. Um, I first, you know, was introduced to Haiti. I mean, I suppose I remember it, about it. I remember the earthquake happening, uh, but really didn't pay particular, particularly close attention to Haiti until I went into the Young Adult Service Corps. Um, so for those who uh, don't know what that is, um, it is a program that the Episcopal Church runs that places young adults outside of their home country um, for a year of service. Um, and these years of service are structured in um, broader and deeper relationships between the Episcopal Church here in the U.S. Um, and other international places, you know, within the Episcopal Church and within the Anglican Communion. Um, I cannot recommend that program enough. Um, so if there are young adults here, or if you know young adults who, um, who are interested in doing something like that, uh, please be in touch with me um, or just look up the Young Adult Service Corps program directly. Um, it's an experience that really just, it fundamentally changed my life. It changed how I view interacting across difference. Um, the training and orientation that they provide ahead of leaving is uh, something that I re refer to constantly, um, even though it was only, you know, the training was about two weeks long. Um, it's just a really wonderful opportunity to not just sort of be in a new place, but to, to enter into a relationship that existed, you know, before I came in um, and will, you know, has existed afterwards, um, which I think comes, it, it came with a layer of reassurance, um, you know, that someone was there to welcome me and moving, you know, to a different country, uh, but also a sense of responsibility um, that there's a relationship here. Uh, bigger than myself um, that I'm, I'm uh, being invited into. Um, and I think that's ultimately, you know, at the center of what we're called to do and be in the world in, in community with one another, whether it is in uh, New Jersey or Maryland, where I am now, or, or in Haiti, um, it's to be in that type of community. Um, I'm going to share my screen and do a little bit of like elementary, uh, an elementary look at a map. Um, I love maps. Maybe some of you are uh, dazed and confused by maps. Um, I know my spouse does not care for them, uh, but he speaks a lot of different languages. So uh, I can get us to places and he can speak to people once we're there. Um, so uh, Haiti is quite close to the United States. Um, for those who don't know, uh, it's just uh, about a 90 minute flight from Miami. Uh, it's around three hours from New York. Um, and it uh, is about, you know, the, the western third or so of the island of Hispaniola. Um, and the population of Haiti in the Dominican Republic is roughly the same now, uh, but of course the land uh, size um, is half that of the Dominican Republic. Um, so when I moved to Haiti uh, the first time, or the first time, uh, the first placement with the Young Adult Service Corps, I lived in a town called Kanj, which is up here in the Central Plateau. Um, so it's inland, um, it's away from the ocean. You almost can't tell that you're on a Caribbean island from there. Um, other than some, you know, cultural cues, of course, but geographically um, quite different than, you know, where most of the Haitian population lives along the coast and some of these larger um, population centers, but really, really loved my time here in the Central Plateau. Actually, let me see what satellite looks like here. Um, it didn't actually change. There we go. Um, so here's Kanj right here. Um, for those of you who, um, are familiar with uh, Partners in Health. Um, that is where Partners in Health started, um, or uh, uh, which is sort of the name associated with Partners in Health is Paul Farmer, Dr. Paul Farmer, who uh, has done a lot of work on uh, international health care, especially around drug resistant tuberculosis, um, but going to places intentionally that have uh, a really a lack of access to health care um, and the Central Plateau being one of the departments in Haiti that is one of the most under-resourced of all of the departments. 
Um, and so he ended up being connected before he was a doctor with an Episcopal priest, Father LaFontant, um, who established an Episcopal church in Kanj. Um, Kanj itself, um, as you can see, there's a body of water here, um, really only exists because of this body of water. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers worked with the Haitian government to build a hydroelectric dam, which is here, um, to provide a source of electricity to Port-au-Prince. Um, and I use this, uh, this history as an example in my civil discourse class, um, talking about how policy decisions and our collective actions can be complicated uh, because they can benefit some and harm others. Um, and in this case, you know, I think one could look at um, this hydroelectric dam as a positive thing. It is a source of electricity uh, for Port-au-Prince that already struggles with, uh, with consistent access to, uh, to electricity um, and has, you know, to an extent contributed to an improvement in quality of life there. But for the people who lived in this valley along the river, it was relatively, you know, fertile land, um, a bit flatter than these mountains on either side of it. Um, for the people who lived there, it was, it, it upended their lives. Um, and they literally had to flee this valley um, up to the mountaintops here and form the town of Kanj. Um, and so that's where this Episcopal priest, Father LaFontant, was called. Um, it's where Paul Farmer ended up, um, again, before he, he went into his medical education. Um, and there is now a full um, hospital and uh, sort of socioeconomic complex there, which is where I lived for two years, uh, working in economic development. Um, so that's a bit about the Central Plateau. Um, my second placement, um, so I was there for two years. My second placement was in Captation, which is up here on the northern coast. And I think my move there was probably as different um, as moving from the U.S. to the Central Plateau. Um, it's a big city. It's the second largest city in Haiti. Um, it's on the coast, so culturally it's a bit different. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it, it went from being in a really small town of about 34, 3,500 people um, to a city of hundreds of thousands. Um, and it was kind of the interesting thing about it to me is in the small town, I really had very little privacy, uh, very little alone time uh, because everyone was there, everyone was present, everyone was in uh, each other's business um, in, I think, a helpful way. I mean, it was just a wonderful community to be a part of. Cap Haitian is large enough where people can stay in their silos. You know, you have a, an expat community that sticks to itself. You have wealthy Haitians and, and sort of the broader population that, that stick to themselves in different ways too. And so it was a lot more isolated to be in Cap Haitian, um, but a very wonderful experience there too. Um, Labadee, oh, you can see the roller coaster. Um, Labadee, the cruise stop that you mentioned uh, is right up here. Um, the Royal Caribbean cruise stop, is, it's actually a little peninsula, um, but it is cut off. Um, you can't enter the complex from Haiti itself. Um, and uh, Labadee, the town is nearby. Um, when I was in Capation, I worked with an agriculture center that was out here in um, this community, Terre Rouge. Um, it's a, a, a um, agriculture center and technical college for, uh, for, ag um, for agronomy that the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti runs um, and uh, worked in project management there for the revitalization program of that, um, of that uh, school. Um, so that's a bit about the geography, um, where I was and what I did, um, but I'd love to shift into um, sort of some general comments about, um, about Haiti itself and about uh, where it is now. Um, I'm glancing at the chat. Yeah, Bending the Arc is a great documentary about partners in health um, and the work of Paul Farmer, David. I'd, uh, I'd recommend that as well. Um, there was also, I was, I didn't know that's what they were filming, um, but they were filming parts of that while I was in, uh, while I was in Kanj, and it was just weird to have a film crew, like, around uh, the community. Um, it's also strange because so much, there's a lot of attention on partners in health um, that, uh, the town of Kanj, while I was there, Bill Gates visited with his family from across the, uh, they flew in by helicopter um, from the Dominican Republic and landed on a so the soccer field in town, um, which was just odd to see a soccer, uh, a, a huge helicopter with Bill Gates in it um, coming to, to stop by. Um, other sort of celebrities that have passed through um, Kanj Arcade Fire, um, it's a band, Canadian band that some of you may know of, 
Um, you all may recognize some of their music if you've heard it, um, but they um, are fairly big supporters of Haiti and have actually done a concert uh, in Kanj, which everyone in Kanj talks about. The concert happened like a couple of months before I moved there. So uh, it's funny to talk to people who think I heard it, um, but I wasn't actually there for it. Um, and then uh, Bill Clinton as well um, has come through to visit. Um, I wasn't in town uh, when he came though. Um, see another comment about the Nursing Education Collaborative for Haiti. So there's some wonderful, um, there are great, you know, healthcare, other healthcare ministries that the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti is involved in and Episcopalians here in the US, you know, are involved in as well. Um, so I'd love to hear a bit more about that, Margot. Um, while I'm speaking, I'm just going to put on some random pictures of my time. Um, you should be able to see the photo now, I think, of the inside the church. Um, so at any rate, so, you know, Haiti is, it's something that the more I learn about it, I feel like the less I know. Um, and it is also just so instrumental in our understanding of the U.S. history of colonialism um, and the way our world is structured. Um, I mean, so many things have connections to or pass through Haiti. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have seen um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Um, it's a funny movie if you, ha uh, if you haven't seen it. Um, there's a scene where like the, the father is, uh, who's very much, you know, very Greek. He wants every, his daughter to be Greek, uh, the wedding to be Greek. Um, and he says uh, at one point in the movie to, to his, at, at that time, young daughter and friends, give me any word and I'll tell you how it's connected to the Greek language. And I feel that way a little bit about just general facts, like give me some sort of reference and, and we can get it connected to Haiti. Um, it really is uh, so connected to, uh, to our history, to the way things are now. Um, and, you know, it goes back to how Haiti uh, was born. It was the first um, and only country to be formed after a successful slave revolt um, and gained its independence from Napoleon's France in 1804. Um, that was independence was not recognized by the United States until um, the 1860s during Lincoln's uh, administration. Um, and even that decision was more around our geopolitical concerns of, of European influence in the Caribbean. Um, Haiti had to pay back uh, or was forced to pay um, money to France in order to continue to recognize that independence, um, which they did not pay off until into the 20th century. Um, the United States has occupied Haiti uh, for about 20 years um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, which you know I, I reference mostly because of the um, the geographic distribution of the population in Haiti. There was an over concentration of the government, of resources, of industry, and Port-au-Prince during that time, which I think uh, is still you know still has ramifications across the country in terms of uh, the infrastructure development. Uh, or lack thereof in some of the other cities in the country um, and the overpopulation in Port-au-Prince uh, that is, is causing a strain there. Um, you know, one of the things though in, in thinking about Haiti and in thinking about difference um, and engaging with others, you know, I like to, I, I think it's common um, and I, I do the same, I've done the same. I think it's common to think about people in another country as just as being so different from us. We're, we're highlighting the differences, we're highlighting what's unique, uh, we're highlighting the unfamiliar. Uh, but there's one, there was one very, very benign story um, that I really enjoyed from my time in Kanj in particular. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Erman, he's a, a, an agronomist, um, has a little farm um, in an area called Chapiteau, uh, which is across uh, the lake from Kanj, the lake that I showed you all on the map. Um, and, you know, his work in agriculture is instrumental for that region um, in helping to connect uh, sort of individual family farmers to markets where they can sell their goods um, to better practices of agriculture to ones that are hopefully uh, more adept to the climate um, in that in that uh, in the region of the central plateau. Um, and he had just had a, a new kid um, a few months before um, I, this particular visit to his house. And there was an American group. Uh, there were a lot of American groups that passed through Kanj um, to visit, uh, a lot of Episcopal groups that passed through Kanj. And I was, uh, there was one individual who was like, I wanna, really want to walk around town. Would you 
would you take, you know, go on a walk with me, kind of show, show me what town is like. And so I was doing that and said, why don't we go see my friend Aramon? And, and we go to his house and uh, his wife is sitting on the front porch of his home with, uh, with their newborn. And the newborn is crying and crying and crying, just, just it, clearly in, in agony. And the person that I was with, the, the American that I was with, you know, she was taken aback by this. And I think very disturbed um, and starts to talk to me very quickly. There, there was no, the real pleasantries. There was no, let me say hello to these people. Um, it was just straight to, oh my gosh, here's the poor person. Let me help them. What can I do to help them? I need to get them food. They're hungry. They're clearly hungry. Um, meanwhile, I'm trying to sort of balance her English and, and uh, you know, address my friend, my friends in, in Haitian Creole um, and kind of get, get the story straight. And, and um, th this person was getting more and more worked up about the baby that was crying. Um, and more concerned that what she was seeing was a poor uh, Haitian kid who needed, needed food. It turned out that the baby had just lost its first baby tooth um, and it was upset uh, at the pain and the disturbance of losing a baby tooth. Um, and that's why it was crying. Um, and so I shared this and the situation calmed back down. Um, but that story sticks with me because it's just it, we, I think, often overlook how similar we are as people, despite all of those differences. And when we overlook those similarities, I don't think we have, we don't have our, we don't get bearings on how we are in this together, on how we're connected to one another, even if we are so far apart geographically, linguistically, culturally, uh, economically. Um, and that, that moment was just like, okay, wow, I remember losing a tooth. You know, we all lose our baby teeth uh, at some point, and sometimes it's startling. Um, sometimes it's exciting. Uh, it, it sort of depends, maybe on on the the age. Um, and um, at any rate, so that that to me really is ties to the or or provides dissonance, I suppose, with how the United States and Haiti um, interact with each other. Um, there are a lot of criticisms about uh, about the United States and their posture toward Haiti. Um, there have been various instances where the U.S. has intervened in changes in administration. Uh, we supported the Duvalier dictatorship for quite some time, um, although there are some who are, you know, still uh, sympathetic or, or reminiscent to that era. Um, we have since then been involved in um, the reintroduction and removal of uh, President Aristide, um, who was president at two different moments, um, separated across time, two different moments in Haiti. Uh, and then, of course, immediately after the earthquake, um, the two people who were appointed the head of sort of the coordinated effort of the, the earthquake response in 2010 uh, were Presidents Clinton and, and Bush. Um, and so there's, there's just a uh, really strong connection and tie between the United States and Haiti um, politically. And so the space that I'm in now, um, and this will sort of be my last few comments before I open it up more broadly to, to hear what you want to know about. Um, my work since I, I got back to the United States, you know, I, I really enjoyed the development work that I was involved in. Um, the picture that's up here now um, is the marketplace um, in Kanj, which you can see is on the road. Um, this is the road through town. It's really the only one. It's the only paved one, um, and it's this. It's the main artery that goes up through the central part of the country, um, and it's quite dangerous. Um, there were people who were in the market who actually died in a car accident while I was there. Um, and uh, one of the projects we were working on was figuring out how to get this market relocated to a different location, um, and it ultimately didn't work out um, through a series of miscommunications between uh, U.S. donors and um, and the local government, um, but it was one of the first times that, uh, at least with the Episcopal Church involvement there, that we actually interfaced with the local government on something. And, and in Haiti's case, um, local governments have jurisdiction over public markets. Um, so if we were going to form this as something, move the market into a place that was more formal off of the road, it would have to fall under the purview of the local government. So it was about capacity building. Um, but at any rate, in seeing, you know, working in the development space, I wanted to see what the policy development side was like. And that led me to look for jobs in DC, ended up at the Episcopal Church's Office of Government Relations. 
um, which represents the, the Episcopal Church's policy positions to the U.S. government. Um, and in that work, um, our office has been a part of something called the Haiti Advocacy Working Group. Um, it's a group of, it started as mostly faith organizations that had connections in Haiti in some way, um, but there are a lot of secular organizations involved as well. Um, and it formed after the 2010 earthquake to help uh, hold the U.S. government accountable in the aid that they were providing. Um, it was actually instrumental in getting the Haiti Aid Accountability Act passed um, a couple of years after the, I think it was two years maybe when that passed after the earthquake, so 2012. Um, and we've been involved, th that, that working group has been involved in advocacy around immigration, temporary protected status, um, informing members of Congress um, about the different sort of expert areas of the, the HOG members. Um, there's a group that works with labor unions in Haiti. There's a group that works on gender issues specifically, several that work on environmental concerns. Um, and so I really got to see how um, policy can be influenced uh, in the US and to really learn the importance that I of using the power I have as an American citizen, as a US voter, um, to push for policies that can be beneficial and helpful to Haiti's development rather than harmful to it, uh, when in the past it has been so harmful. Um, it's something that's quite, uh, you know, difficult and stubborn and requires a lot of patience, uh, but I think is, is sort of central to uh, the relationship building and what we're doing here. Uh, this photo here is of the uh, one angle of the lake. It's from Chapiteau, my friend Aramon that I mentioned. Has, he's from over on the side of the lake. Um, and you can see the top of the dam um, uh, in, the, in the distance there. Um, so with that, you know, somewhat random conversations, I'd love to hear it. And Christian, too, let me know if there are, are areas that you'd like me to go over um, about Haiti. If you all have any questions, I'm happy to uh, get into some conversation about it. There's a question in the chat. Um, Brenda asked, what did Bush and Clinton accomplish and would you consider their work effective? You know, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that anyone has really um, talked about their accountability and the response to the earthquake. Um, one of the bigger problems after the earthquake, you know, Haiti gained the nickname the Republic of NGOs or non-governmental organizations following the earthquake because there were so many different international organizations um, that um, moved in uh, and tried to help. But the issue with that, well, there were a couple of main issues. One is that it often bypassed the Haitian government. Um, so the U.S. actually went in and took over the, um, the airports um, for a period of time. There was a, a in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, the U.S. concern was there's going to be mass unrest and violence. Um, that is not what actually bared out. Um, it was actually an amazing moment where you had, I mean, it was, the estimates are 200 to 300,000 people killed, um, you know, it's several million displaced. Um, so an enormous impact for, for a population of, a country of, with a population of 11 million people, that's an enormous percentage of the population impacted by that event. Um, people came together and responded and worked well together, but that was not the initial response from the U.S. Um, you know, longer term, I think the, the minimization or um, efforts to go around the Haitian government weakened the relationship between the Haitian population and their, their elected officials or the officials in the government um, in a way that was counterproductive. Um, and though there were billions of dollars, you know, in aid pledged, uh, most of that money didn't actually make it to Haiti. Um, part of it, it was, some of it was just never used. It was never actually allocated and worked with part of it, uh, but a lot of it went to contractors, uh, development organization staff that are based in the United States or are based in other countries, um, you know, and, and sort of paid this um, network of people that were, you know, theoretically working on the development, but weren't actually there. It wasn't actually direct investment into Haiti itself. Um, another documentary I'd recommend on that particular issue is called Poverty Inc. Um, INC, um, but Poverty Inc. is really great. They talk about the industry of these non-government organizations, um, but uh, use Haiti a lot in their examples. So one of the examples they raised 
um, okay, Haiti has an electricity problem after the earthquake in particular, a lot of the facilities that were there were damaged. Um, there was a, a local startup um, business in Port-au-Prince that was already producing solar panels before the earthquake happened. They ended up having to close because all of the NGOs that wanted to help switch to solar seems to be a positive thing. They exclusively imported solar panels. And so that took all of the business away from this business, from the, the producer of solar panels in Haiti. Uh, and they had to close, they had no more clients. Um, and so they, they do a deeper dive there. That's just one example of kind of how the bigger picture, you know, disaster response can actually play out on the ground. Um, yeah, I see what, what things do people do in the Young Adult Service Corps. Um, it really varies. Um, and the, the process for the Young Adult Service Corps is, um, it involves a commitment to the program, not to particular placement. Um, so once, when you fill out the application, um, and if you're, and you are likely to receive an invitation to uh, what they call a discernment weekend. Um, when I wish all Episcopalians could have a discernment weekend. I mean, it's just, whether it's for YASC specifically or just your personal growth, it's an amazing experience to spend three to four days together um, with the, the staff that run the program. Um, reflecting on what do you want to be doing? You know, who are you? What is your relationship to the church? Um, it, it's really, it isn't an interview. It really is a, a mutual discernment process where the staff can decide, are you right for the program? And you can decide, is the program right for you? Um, and ultimately there's sort of a, an interplay uh, rather than saying you're accepted. It's sort of a, a you reach a mutual decision together um, in the two weeks or so after the discernment weekend. Um, but again, it's it's to the program, it's not to the placement. And the staff really work hard at um, in learning about you and going that in depth to you know your interests, your fears, your um, what what sort of drives you and, and sparks you sparks your energy and, and, and um, desire to engage. They will work on matching you to a placement where they feel like you can thrive. Um, and so there, there are times where, you know, someone has said, I really don't want to be in a big city, um, but through the discernment process, you know, to the staff, it's like, mm, actually, there is a big city placement where we think you would thrive, and that may be where you are sent. Um, and almost always, you know, those, those pairings are uh, productive and successful. Um, in terms of the, the work, um, some people come in as kind of a, a <clears throat> generalist or without a special uh, skill. I was kind of one of those examples. Um, so going to work in economic development in Haiti was fairly broad. Um, I did do it, ended up doing it as a part of a, a program that's connected to Clemson University called Clemson Engineers for Developing Countries. Um, so there were some tangible pieces that they had already uh, started on that I ended up kind of latching on to. Um, We've had nurses, for example, work in uh, healthcare positions in different parts in South Africa. Um, Mission to Seafarers um, is one of the oldest uh, ministries in the Anglican Communion that, um, that provides pastoral care to people that work in the shipping industry. Um, they're in hundreds of locations around the world in ports. Um, and so there's a position in Hong Kong, um, Osaka, I think, uh, and then Wellington, New Zealand for Mission to Seafarers. Um, and that involves boarding boats when they come into harbor and and you know delivering a care package checking in on people um there are all sorts of different things it, it really is sort of the sky is the limit to an extent um and it depends on where you know the where in the anglican communion is expressing interest in receiving somebody in, in the young adult service corps but um i love it it's amazing uh it's a wonderful community um to be a part of um and, and again still just uh influences my life so much Let's see. Okay, so Haitian, how has the Haitian government dealt with the returnees forcibly expelled from the DR? Um, so, you know, it really, it is a human rights concern. Um, I don't think Haiti is in any position to receive um, immigrants or, or to receive returned um, immigrants either from the DR or from the United States. Um, so the uh, the Biden administration um, passed a uh, did an executive order for a hundred day moratorium on deportations from the United States. There was a ruling under what's called Title Forty Two 
in Texas and the courts that overturned that. And there have been about 29 deportation flights since the beginning of the Biden administration. All of them have gone back to Haiti. Um, so the US is still deporting people to Haiti despite that moratorium. Um, and despite Haitians in the US having temporary protected status, I can go into some technical stuff there um, if you're interested. But sort of generally speaking, I mean, the Haitian government isn't responding with much there. Um, and the, the Dominican Republic, I think there's been a lot of animosity over the years between the two countries. Um, and one could argue that the Dominican, that the DR is using, you know, the, the pandemic as a reason to kind of be more forceful in the border. Um, you know, I think there's also some reason to keeping borders shut as well, especially early on when we weren't as clear on the, you know, where the pandemic would go. Um, but uh, yeah, it does seem to be a, a clear human rights issue and is one that, you know, I, I think will be with us and take a long time to resolve even, even beyond the pandemic. Alan, this is Howard Mackey. I have two questions. One, um, what would you uh, suggest are the key natural resources of most key natural resources in the country? And two, uh, what would you identify as the major industries in the country? Sure. So, you know, natural resources, I mean, people, Haiti used to be a premier tourism destination um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, the Clintons actually did their honeymoon there. Um, so there is, I think, a huge potential for tourism, which isn't, you know, so the, so the natural resources perspective, um, the beaches, uh, the mountains as well. Um, I'll actually, let me go back. Uh, this is probably the coolest historical site I've ever visited. It's called the Citadel. Um, it was built um, by uh, King Henry Christophe, the um, first self-appointed king of Haiti, um, to, uh, in a sense, loose history, to prevent uh, Napoleon from coming back and taking the island again. Um, Napoleon was never able to do that. Um, and in fact, the, going back to the Greek, um, the Greek father reference, um, the Louisiana Purchase, um, which of course added a huge swath of land to the United States, um, happened during this time period because Napoleon needed more funds to continue to fight the war in Haiti. Um, so the U.S. ended up with the Louisiana pur Purchase because of this. Um, but this citadel, um, is just incredible. It has one of the uh, largest collections of artillery from that era in the world, um, from all different European powers. Um, it's just a there are inland, you know, resources, the coast resources, the music and the culture. Um, Carnival and Jacmel um, is amazing. Jacmel is on the coast, southern coast of Haiti, and has a wonderful sort of arts and and music culture there. Um, so I think that's a big resource. Um, Agriculture is to an extent. Um, there are some areas of Haiti that are fairly, uh, they're agriculturally, you know, fertile, um, even with it, the majority of the landmass being covered in mountains um, that are harder to, to produce um, agriculture on. Um, other industries include textiles. Um, there was a, uh, the U.S. government through USAID um, was involved post-earthquake with a new industrial park on the northern coast near Cap Haitian. Um, to and I mean I have my undershirts that I wear are from uh, their Haynes undershirts and they're made in Haiti. They come from that. Um, they come from that facility. Um, you know that is without explain over explaining um, that particular industrial park um, actually took over land um, without due process of the farmers that were living there um, and did not properly compensate those farmers. Um, there was a successful uh, lawsuit brought against um, that uh, industrial park that ended up compensating them probably last year. So it was, it was seven or eight years after their land was taken, something like that. Um, and one of the members of the Haiti Advocacy Working Group was instrumental in, in sort of guiding that process and, and working with the farmer associations that actually brought that, um, that lawsuit out. Um, an incredible, incredible job. Um, Haiti used to um, be a rice exporter. Um, so there is a, a potential there to, for agriculture, I think, especially in, um, in fruits, uh, like tropical fruits and um, and grains to an extent. Um, the rumors that Coca-Cola is looking there for um, for resources on for stevia, um, the artificial sweetener, 
Um, Heineken is the biggest foreign investor there. They have a large brewery um, in Port-au-Prince um, that makes the now makes the Haitian beer called Prestige, along with a lot of other drinks. And they um, also are investing in a lot of agriculture in the country um, that then go into those products. Um, so those are the main things. Um, there are which I think honestly is playing out in the politics of the country now. Um, there are rumors or suspicions that there are gold um, deposits, especially in the northern part of the country and different companies, international companies have kind of partitioned off that land um, working with the Haitian government, um, but the mining itself hasn't started yet. Um, so there are some organizations that are looking at the potential negative impacts of that, the exploitive impacts of that, um, and are using El Salvador um, as an example. Um, El Salvador is, a, uh, I think it's the first country or the only country to ban mining, um, extractive mining. Um, and so the consideration is, is that an option for Haiti? Should it be? Or is there an opportunity for Haiti to, um, you know, for the Haitian government to earn funds through, through that mining? And that could be invested um, in the country itself. There are a number of arguments there. Yeah, I have a, I have, well, a comment. Um, sure. Earlier you spoke about the um, government, U.S. government coming in. And anyway, my question, I wrote an essay in the New York Times today speaks to an analogous situation in Minneapolis, i.e. preserving the power structure while being oblivious to the reality of the people who live there. So uh, that was brought to mind. Also, is the Peace Corps effective in Haiti? Uh, the Peace Corps has not been in Haiti for quite some time. Um, I don't remember, I don't think the Peace Corps left because of the earthquake. I think they left in the early 90s, if I'm not mistaken, but my, my memory is fuzzy on that. Yeah, I was in the Peace Corps in Malaysia years ago. So. Cool, awesome. Yeah, so yeah, you're was, doing something very similar. Yeah, yeah, I was looking at the Peace Corps at the same time. I was actually farther along in the Peace Corps process when I heard about the Young Adult Service Corps um, and ended up choosing Young Adult Service Corps just because it was... I, I liked that comfort of being in a, a church relationship. So it's like, I'm abroad as an American and as a member of the Episcopal Church. Um, but people choose it, you know, different programs for different reasons. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this Alan, is, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just gonna put it out there. Um, when we had started the, the conversation to put this day together, um, one of the things that sparked it for me was the piece that Mark Harris wrote which I, I don't remember if I sent it to you or not, but it was sort of critical of the broader church's attitude towards um, Haiti and, and sort of, I think you, you had mentioned before about the, the aid pledges that didn't quite pan out and everything that, that, that went on there. Um, and he was sort of critical in that we have this, we seem to have a, a very parental um autocratic mindset when we go in and you you made me think about it when you talked about the guest and how she responded to the situation that she saw in front of her um one of the things that i particularly would like to understand is how to turn that on its head and i mentioned in the in the preview reel the statistic that this is a diocese of nine a pro, i think it's ninety thousand people at this point which has grown largely you know in the last 50 years or so. And that is in contrast to what's going on in the broader church. And I would like to understand how we um, put ourselves in a position of listening to these folks who are clearly making evangelism work and what it is that the Holy Spirit could help us learn from, from our church family in Haiti. Sure. Well, thank you for raising that. and. Um you know, to add, I mean, the Diocese of Haiti, it's one of the largest, the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti is one of the largest educators, um, non-government educators in the country. Um, I think there are around 200 schools, and that's anything from the Episcopal University in Port-au-Prince, uh, the nursing school in Laogan, the agriculture center I mentioned outside of Capetian, all the way up to uh, to small parish schools. I mean, the school, the, the parish in Conj, which you show, I showed you was very rural, there were something like 20 separate schools connected with that parish, um, each in their own little community um, around that area. Um, you know, so I think, and this is the case with advocacy too, I think it's similar, you know, 
our office and, and representing the church's policies to the US government, we're there to say, okay, vote, vote this way, vote that way. Here are, here's, you know, are the church's values and um, that's a piece of it, but it's also about stepping back and saying, how can we, what can we learn from you? How can we be a resource to you? Um, being in less of an instructive, we're here with the solutions position and more one of listening. And I think that's a way that, um, that's something that people overlook when they're engaging with Haiti or, or any international development sort of relationship um, is they, there's this overemphasis and sometimes it's, we're unaware of it, of uh, we're resourced, they're not. Um, and so how can we use our resources to fill that hole? Um, and it really is more about relationship building. Um, I mean, I, I sort of mentioned, maybe I, maybe it came across as a bit too uh, crass or something, you know, that I didn't necessarily have a particular expertise going into Haiti, but the point of the Young Adult Service Corps placements isn't framed around what can you accomplish while you're there? What gap can you fill in the place that you're going? It is, you're entering into a relationship with people. And you may be changed more than you're ever going to change them. Um, but the point is you're going to be interacting with each other where they are as humans, and they are going to be doing the same with you. Um, and so I think it's just so important to keep that in mind that when we are engaging with parishes in Haiti, when we're engaging with our Haitian brothers and sisters, uh, Haitian siblings, that they're people as well, um, that they have assets and lessons for us to learn um, and it's not like the, you know the the way that plays out isn't like okay well let's sit at a table and write out you know what our resources are and then you know do an exchange it's more fluid than that but um, having that mindset I think leads us to, to a much healthier place um, and we often don't do that um, it's also difficult to me um, I don't know what the numbers are these numbers are outdated so the when I was there in 2015, 2015, 2016, the development office of the Episcopal Church was trying to get a sense of the unique Episcopal relationships between the Diocese of Haiti and Episcopal entities in the US. So it might be schools that are paired together, it might be a parish that's paired with another parish. Um, and their non-exhaustive list reached 600 unique relationships between Episcopal entities in the US and the Diocese of Haiti. So that's only the Episcopal Church. And the Episcopal Church in Haiti, though it is our largest diocese, um, it's still relatively small next to like the Catholic Church. Um, the Mormons, Mormon Church there is growing. Um, you know, so there's, um, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, I guess it's just when when we think about being in relationship with people, we've got to consider uh, to not just look at them as as having uh, as having some as lacking something, um, but also having something um, there. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want me to pick up more in that reflection. I guess I mean, and we could talk about it more. Mm -hmm. um yeah you know, on the practical level i guess really i mean you answered my question in the in the psychological sense like i think just how do, how do we place ourselves in that attitude of listening um the the idea i think too is you know of course we're not you know you're not pushing it fully to an exploitive thing either it's just seeing seeing these people as adults with intelligence with ideas with goals and you know how to uh how to balance that with the very real and practical imbalance of of physical assets that we of course our instincts as christians are i want to fix that just like your friend you know and a lot of us don't see that day to day that kind of stark difference so i guess that impulse is normal and and comes from a good place but the, the relationship, I would guess, has to be more than that if it's going to if it's going to be um, effective. Right. Yeah, it does have to be more than that, and you know, it, it can. It doesn't mean avoiding being honest about you know resource differences. Um, being honest that you know we're going to be more resourced financially, likely than the than the um, than the Haitian partners in the church, but. 
um, it, that fact alone shouldn't overshadow what resources, resources are available there. Um, Episcopal Relief and Development's um, asset-based community development model um, is, uh, I think, helpful to keep in mind here and, and to use, uh, where rather than just looking at, and I mean, even, even in our own parishes in the US, you know, what are the assets that we have and how do we build off of those assets rather than asking what don't we have and how do we get it? Um, it, it really leads to entirely different conclusions um, and I think alters the nature of engagement in a healthy way to ask what are our assets here um, to be open to that um, because we you know run the risk of that type of paternalistic um, approach otherwise. What else are, are folks curious about um, in terms of Haiti, in terms of our current policies there uh, with the US um, or culture, music, um, food? Um, did I hear someone unmute? I, I have a question. Sure. It's Margo and this may be a a somewhat controversial question. Um, I'm just curious, my, my impression is that um, many Haitians are culturally quite conservative. And is there a mismatch between the sort of progressive views of the Episcopal Church in America and the Episcopal Church in Haiti? Yeah, so um, a couple of comments on that, you know, so the Diocese of Haiti is a part of the Episcopal Church that's based in the U.S. Um, so we're the Episcopal Church, what's formerly called the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America, the formal name, uh, actually involve, uh, is located in 17 different nations, um, Haiti being one of them, one of those 17. Um, and so, you know, there there is a conservative, I think, lean to uh, the diocese there, um, the former bishop um, who, who retired, um, Bishop Durison, I believe, signed a letter against like the the marriage equality movement in uh, within the Episcopal Church, for example. Um, but overall, I mean, there are ways that Haiti is conservative in in things like having school uniform that we may say is conservative, having school uniforms, keeping a certain look about you to be professional. Um, you know, there's a conservative, uh, it's conservative in that sense, but conservative socially, conservative politically, it's a mixed bag. Um, and I think part of the tension <laughs> from my perspective or what I've seen um, is you have a population of Haiti, it's uh, the a large um, portion of the population practices voodoo or at least believes in it. Um, voodoo is not uh, sort of this businessified, um, simplified like uh, quasi magic. It's a full religion with, um, uh, and it's actually monotheistic, although there are different spirits that people can communicate through. Um, it has this whole structure. Uh, many people are both uh, voodooisant and um, Christian, um, most often Catholic, but of course Episcopalian as well. I mean, I think voodoo actually is quite open to, you know, gender nonconformity, to um, diversity and sexual orientation. Um, and, and yet the international churches, especially some of the evangelical churches from the United States are bringing quite harsh uh, perspectives um, into the fold in Haiti. Um, which I think is, is a somewhat new phenomenon, um, you know, to have that, that anti-gay perspective come in. Um, it's unfortunate. I think it leads to a, a question that is, you know, as we touched on colonialism a bit in the conversation, you know, is there a role to play as a, a you know, open and affirming denomination? Do we also go and sort of counter, go to Haiti and counter that work? Um, of the, the evangelical churches in the U.S. that are, are promoting a pro-gay message, you know, or is that just sort of moving a cultural culture battle overseas into another country? Um, it's quite complicated, uh, but that's sort of my rough sense of it, uh, is that it's not as straightforward as it seems. Um, 
That sounds like history repeating itself from Western Africa, except that it was the our church that brought those ideas in. Yep. And the the um, I didn't speak to this. I think it was in some of your slides actually, but um, the first bishop in Haiti of the Diocese of Haiti was the Episcopal Church's first black bishop, um, James Theodore Holly, um, from the U.S. and was part of uh, this early wave of um, of black Americans who uh, moved overseas. Um, Haiti being one of the places that they moved to. Um, and so he established the Episcopal Church there, and uh, it has grown um, grown ever since. I noticed too after I put that together that the bishop from this that uh, until the seventies, um, none of the bishops were born there, um, and at, at least I didn't see any. I think it was noted that the the, the guy in I think he was in seventy nine or something was noted as the first Haitian born bishop. And the one who immediately preceded him came up here in New Jersey, went to general and was the rector in Harrington Park in Bergen County, very near our church. So there was a pattern for a while after Holly, it looks like of the other, the church sending people there. Yep, absolutely. Um, so note about, um, and if there are other questions, folks, please, um, please feel free to ask. Um, this is an example of like, it's actually not an Episcopal school, but what one of the more rural schools might look like. Um, so you can see in, there are two buildings here. Um, the tarp is sort of around the kitchen area. Um, there's like the preschool and then a couple of elementary school classrooms, um, very simple facilities. Um, and this is probably a hour and a half to two hours, hour and a half walk um, from the nearest road um, so these types of, you know, settings exist all across the country um, and uh, are where the, the Episcopal Church and others have tried to bring, you know, education um, to the extent that they can. Um, it's also where um, one of the more sort of difficult, I think, individual tasks I did uh, while in Haiti was interpreting for, uh, for medical clinics. Um, there were groups of doctors who would come in and from the U.S. Um, and partner with Haitian doctors and Haitian nurses uh, to do you know, day-long uh, medical clinics, mostly around hypertension. Um, but any time a medical clinic happens, people come sort of with any um, any uh, illness or problem, uh, and we would use these schools for those clinics. Uh, it was quite an extraordinary um, thing to do. Um, and then those programs or those doctors, again, working with partners in health, working with um, local providers. Um, created networks of community health workers who have who follow up with the people who received um, treatment or received medication to make sure that they can keep getting that medication um, that it's it's working for them well. Um, you know, it's it's quite a different model than we have in most places in the U.S. Um, for healthcare. But um, despite the amazing lack of resources, it's um, it does quite a bit of good. Um, so that's what you're looking at here in this picture. Um, this was on that same the same visit to that particular school. Um, we were all laughing, uh, this guy's, um, actually, no, the guy that took the picture, um, his name was Lucien and, uh, the horse's name was Lucien. And so we were, this was like a running joke during the whole visit that, um, we didn't know which Lucien to, to talk to refer to. Um, but people were, uh, people enjoyed that. This is in the medical complex in Kanj, um, a big tree fell. Um, and so people made, uh, a dugout canoe. Um, from the chunk of the tree, which they used to go back and forth across the lake that I showed you. Um, there is one motorized boat on the lake um, that was working sometimes, but most of the time um, people and you know will bring their goods um, that they grew across the lake over to the road um, in these canoes. Uh, there's a wonderful in the in um, uh, the Bon Sauveur Parish um, in Kanj, they had a wonderful music program um, that was connected to the music program at Trinity Cathedral, the Episcopal Cathedral in Port-au-Prince. Um, that program each summer uh, would have a three-week music camp um, for Haitians from across the country, and, and it would attract instructors from around the world uh, as well. Um, and they actually held that in Kanj um, in, in, for the years after the earthquake. Um, because the, the cathedral and the facilities there fell, uh, fell, fell in the earthquake. And so this was a Christmas concert that they put on. Um, just an amazing, uh, that particular music camp, it's wild to be, you know, a town of 3,400 people. And then for three weeks in the summer, 
you know, you end up with four or 500 kids with an instrument um, mm -hmm. playing and practicing music all around town. Um, and then they'd have concerts and that sort of thing. It's really quite extraordinary um, to have that. It's really a beautiful and, and sort of a pleasure uh, to have that right at my doorstep. Um, this is an example. Um, I mean, just a, a small example of a voodoo ceremony. This is around um, uh, All Saints Day, uh, November 1st. Um, this is another a common occurrence, um, or a common occurrence, a common site across Haiti. It's a, a Claren distillery. Claren is their, um, like a local um, alcohol made of sugar cane. Um, and so those barrels are each full of um, sort of the processing uh, liquid uh, that's processed in the stoves that you see underneath the, the metal, um, the metal roof there, um, has quite a smell to it. Um, this is the Partners in Health. Uh, this is sort of their flagship hospital that they built with the Haitian government in Mirbele. Um, it was about maybe 25 minutes away from Kanj. Um, World-class teaching hospital, um, just a really extraordinary facility um, by any country's measure. Um, but to have this in Haiti um, in one of the most underserved uh, regions as well um, makes it ever the more important. Uh, but really, really cool place um, that's still running. I have several friends um, who are from Kanj that are now in medical school in Port-au-Prince and they're doing their residencies here. You know, I've, I've got a question. Sure. What was the reason given, if you know, by the Dominican Republic and kicking out Haitians Many of the Haitians who lived in the Dominican Republic were born there, et cetera, were given less than a day's notice to get out or to be killed. And right now, I think I read that the Dominican Republican Republic has fortified militar militarily, fortified their border to keep Haitians out. Um, what reason did they give for that? Was it economic or... You know, I, I don't know, I don't know what reason they gave for, for those actions, like most recently. Um, it's just, it's not a specific issue that I've tracked all that closely. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, there, there's certainly racism or colorism, depending on which term, you, some use both terms uh, to describe that dynamic in the Dominican Republic, um, yeah. basically anti-Haitian sentiment. Um, and there were times, I mean, even like what, when I was living in Haiti, um, there were a couple of times the Dominican Republic tried to change their citizenship laws where you had to prove uh, that you had residency in the Dominican Republic for a certain number. It was like, I don't remember what the exact year was. It was like back to like 1940 or something like that. Well, last which, year they got rid of that totally. Now exactly. it doesn't matter if you were born there. If you're Haitian, you're out. Exactly. So it's, it's right. part of a longer pattern. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just connected to the pandemic. And that's why I said some are arguing that they're, they're leveraging the pandemic, you know, to be a bit harsher, but I don't, I don't know that I find that terribly convincing because they have been harsh in the past. I, I, I know that even if you're Dominican and you have darker skin, you're called Haitian and you might be subject to being kicked out of the country as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know of examples of being kicked out of the country like in, in that case, but certainly there's a lot of, of uh, prejudice oh, and okay. stigma yeah. around that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. See. Um, and there is one, I'm blanking on the name. Um, what is the name of that organization? There's one of one of the Haiti Advocacy Working Group members, um, OMBICA, O-M-B-I-C-A, I think is their acronym, um, works exclusively on, on this particular topic. I um, see. So I usually refer to them. Um, Sorry, let me try to put this in the chat. I think it's Ombika. Um, I, I refer to them on this topic because um, they, they track that, um, and the, the statelessness issue um, in Haiti. But I mean, there are a lot of jobs. It's, they're echoes of you know, the United States immigration problem, um, right. immigration dynamic, where there are a lot of jobs in, in the Dominican Republic that um, Haitians fill that Dominicans don't necessarily want to fill or do. Um, so the economies are, are very much intertwined. Um, there are a lot of goods that are, that are illegally um, uh, transported back and forth across the border. And that doesn't just mean, I don't mean like drugs, like the goods themselves, you know, are, are necessarily negative. It's literally just, it's consumer goods stuff to avoid um, different um, uh, importation fees and, and that sort of thing. 
um, is illegally you know, passed across the Haitian and Haitian Dominican border. Human trafficking is a big issue. Um, so there, there's a lot, it's a complicated island. Um, and it's one that the French and the Spanish, you know, vied over for quite some time. Um, you know, there, uh, Trujillo is a, a well-known name, the former uh, leader of the Dominican Republic. And um, there was a, a massacre of Haitians, uh, near Cap Haitian, sort of on the river that, that uh, divides the two countries in the north. Um, that, you know, still sticks in people's minds significantly. But then, the, you know, the DR also has examples of abuse of former, you know, French and Haitian leadership um, and their, uh, their actions on the Eastern, you know, two thirds of the island too. Thank you. Yeah. Ellen, not to put you on the spot, but um, mm -hmm. would you be able, if, if, if folks were interested in looking at other ways to be engaged or more involved to um, recommend any starting points? Or um, I know we have Bending the Arc and Poverty Inc. Um, just didn't know if there were any other organizations or starting points for further finding out more or further engagement or involvement. I may, um, I'm bringing up the email that I sent you. Um, hopefully I can find it quickly. Um, yes, here we go. Yeah, I mean, so the Episcopal Church is itself is involved in a lot of interesting things there. Um, the St. Barnabas Agriculture Center that I mentioned um, is still in their revitalization program, um, and there are ways to, to donate there. Um, Episcopal Relief and Development does a lot of work in the country, although I did not interact with them much. Their focus has been mostly along the Southern Peninsula, um, which is just not somewhere where I lived, so I didn't, I didn't cross paths with them. Um, for you know, healthcare, um, Partners in Health is a great organization to support. Um, they're in, I think, 14 different countries now, um, including the United States. They have some facilities and, and programs in uh, what we call Navajo land um, out west, um, but they do some amazing work. Um, SOIL, um, S-O-I-L, Sustainable Organic something living, um, but they work in, with composting toilets. Um, so, I mean, the many of us in the US, I grew up this way, not really thinking twice about the importance of a toilet, uh, but having functioning plumbing and clean sanitation is enormous in terms of development. Um, and so they are uh, working both Port-au-Prince and Cap Haitian um, in developing networks of, co of composting toilets and sort of services where you know, they have Haitians that go around and Haitian employees that go around and service the toilets that are in place. It really is transforming sanitation in pretty significant ways. They're an amazing organization um, from an education standpoint, Summits Education. Um, they work in the Central Plateau uh, with a lot of those schools that I, I said were um, a part of that Episcopal parish there. Anseye um, Pouaiti, um, which translates roughly as Teach for Haiti. Um, is about what it sounds like if you're familiar with Teach for America. Um, it's a program that helps um, train uh, Haitian teachers and educators. Um, the uh, woman who started that, she is from Hench, in the, also in the Central Plateau, um, and is an Episcopalian. Um, she does wonderful, wonderful work with, with Fancy Pouaiti, who's a super dynamic person. Um, economic support, um, Franc Jose is a bank and like financial services organization. Um, the Solidarity Center in Haiti um, works with a lot of the um, different uh, um, like businesses and unions, such as they are. Sometimes they're not actually formed in the union. Um, they do some great work there. Human rights. There's the Internet, um, Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti um, and the Center for Economic and Policy Research, which is based here in D.C., um, they do some great work around Haiti. Um, and then I also, the last thing I always like to recommend to people is just to consider buying Haitian products. Um, I'm a fan of buying local um, and supporting local businesses, but there are also times, um, I don't, the last time I checked, I don't think there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, of um, sugar cane and rum production um, in New Jersey, for example. Um, but, you know, there are places where you can be intentional about who you're buying from. Um, and so, yeah, Christian mentioned um, these names are all going to be uh, at the end of the session. Um, but there are a couple of businesses. Creole Essence um, has a lot of hair products, skin products. I use their lotion and shampoo 
uh, and conditioner. Um, Tahomi uh, makes really good um, chocolate uh, cacao powder. Um, I use that in smoothies, use it for baking. Um, I love Haitian peanut butter. So that was one little random thing about the Young Adult Service Corps is uh, most places around the world don't have peanut butter, like it's not in people's diets. And so a lot of people, sort of my peers, you know, moving to Africa, Asia, South America, they're like, man, I really want, I miss peanut butter. Haitian peanut butter, I think is better than what we have in the US. Um, and La Vie, L-A-V-I um, is a Haitian peanut butter company that's now importing to the US or, or exporting to the US. Um, I don't know, there's a lot. So think about buying as well and supporting small businesses in that way um, is another great approach to have. Yes, the, and the, I see the occupational and physical therapy practitioners um, at the, the University in Leogan, amazing, amazing program. Um, so if, if that's another great for healthcare, um, that would be another great place to direct your, your attention and, and donations. Thank you and thanks, Chris, for putting those on a slide. And uh, speaking of donations, just one last story here if we, if we need to wrap up, but I'm happy to stay around as well. Um, so this is a picture of, uh, it was a new um, satellite parish um, from, from Kanj um, in Tierra Moscadi. And uh, this was the offering at the opening service for the parish. Um, and it's this huge procession, um, you know, at the, at the beginning of the service where people bring up what they can um, and uh, add it around the altar. I mean, this whole space ended up being filled uh, with food and uh, live animals as well. Um, but I love this picture just as a reminder of, you know, what going back to that question of what are our assets, what can we bring to the table, um, and that we all have something to bring to the table. We all have a desire to be generous, um, to look after one another. Um, and that's what this photo reminds me of. Um, and it keeps me humble um, as well. Um, so I wanted to end on, end on this picture. Alan, thank you so very, very much. Um, this was awesome. It, did it, and I didn't mean to cut anybody off. Does anyone else have any questions or comments or? All right. Joan, I'll make a quick comment um, yeah. because I, I do work for a volunteer organization that, that does work in Haiti. And uh, I just want to underscore everything that Alan said about um, the challenges and, um, you know, how best to be effective in Haiti is 100% true. Um, our, our organization tries to be very mindful of the fact that, that we're a grassroots organization and um, we don't, nobody outside of Haiti gets paid by the organization. Um, and it's completely driven by what they understand to be their needs and how best to proceed. And we just provide support. So I, I just wanna underscore that what Alan said about that is so important um, because NGOs can be the neo-colonialists and it's an important thing to avoid. Thanks so much Thank for you. that. Anything else? Ellen, again, thank you so very, very much. It was, um, it was just awesome. It was wonderful to have you with us. And I know I have a lot to learn, but at least I feel like you, you get us off to a great start, me off to a great start. <laughs> and, and Chris, thanks for making, um, for your connection with Alan and helping to make this all come together and for your slides leading up to this and slides with all of the information. So, um, yeah, and for those of you not able to see the, the chat, um, Chris is going to have all of this posted and um, with a link. So, nope, thank you all. So very, very, very much. And um, Alan, God bless you and, and all of your work and look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> And uh, I just dropped my email in the um, in the chat if folks want to stay in touch or reach out through Chris too. They know how to be in touch with me. Yep. No. God bless you and keep you all. And I hope everyone has just a, a wonderful week. So God bless you and keep you. Bye.